On behalf of on behalf of USAID and Resilience Links, I welcome you to Comprehensive Disaster Risk Management, Strategies for Building Resilience. I'm Sophie Fontaine with Resilience Links. Before we begin, I'll orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. Firstly, if you haven't done so already, please use the chat to introduce yourself. To ask questions, use the Q&A button on the bottom right. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust your view. Lastly, we're recording this webinar and we'll distribute the recording via email and social media following the event. You can now see our agenda for today on your screen. Following this brief introduction, I'll pass it to Michael Coons, a Senior Knowledge Management Advisor with USAID's Center for Resilience. Michael will provide some opening remarks. Afterwards, Laura Evans and Catherine Stahlberg, who manage the center's DRM portfolio, will share a technical presentation. Please remember to use the Q&A button to ask questions throughout the presentation. We've reserved plenty of time for an open Q&A moderated by Samantha Levine Finley. Thank you for your attendance today. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Sophie, and thanks to the entire Resilience Links team for organizing this webinar to discuss the role of DRM in strengthening resilience. Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's great to see such an impressive turnout today. As a member of the global resilience community, USAID Center for Resilience is keenly interested in sharing knowledge and learning opportunities to build resilience among households, communities, and systems. Disaster risk management is essential to achieve and maintain well-being outcomes in the face of COVID, climate, conflict, and other significant shocks. Some of you may be familiar with USAID's resilience policy, which underscores the importance of improving local capacities to address and reduce risk. Learning about DRM, DRM initiatives gives us an opportunity to consider insights that can inform and inspire effective responses to local needs in a way that mobilizes investments in people and systems to protect and improve human well being in the face of shocks and stresses. Thank you to all of our speakers and everyone who helped make this webinar possible. And thanks again to everyone for joining today. I'll now hand it over to Catherine Stahlberg and Laura Evans, who will lead our DRM work at USAID's Center for Resilience. Thanks, Catherine and Laura, and over to you. Great, thank you, Michael and uh, Sophie for the introduction. Uh, next slide, please. So today we want to give you about a 40 minute presentation about disaster risk management and the approach that we're taking in the Center for Resilience and the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID. Next slide, please. So today we'll share some infographics, some lessons learned, some key takeaways on disaster risk management with a focus on social protection and disaster risk financing. The definitions we're using for disaster risk management, I will share for you here. Individuals, households, communities, and systems are able to identify their risk exposure and plan and prepare for how to manage risks, thus lessening negative impacts and improving resilient outcomes. I will hand it over to Laura at this point. Next slide, please. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for joining us this morning. And um, I wanted to start with this graphic because it captures comprehensively what it is that we will be discussing today. So throughout the course of the presentation, we will walk you through um, what I'm gonna call this pie chart or pinwheel um, that captures, again, the comprehensive nature of disastrous management. The things that I would like to point out on this slide is on the right-hand side of the slide, prior to when a disaster strikes, are all of the actions that can be taken in anticipation of a disaster. So all of the planning and preparedness and pre-financing that can take place in advance in order to prepare people um, to better cope with disasters, and as Catherine said, to lessen the negative impacts of disasters. On the left-hand side of the graphic, you'll see 
the response recovery and resilience was happens after a disaster. Um, but the right side, again, not only prepares you and helps you to mitigate the impacts, it also shortens the response time um, as well as helps maintain and sustain your sources of resilience. So again, today we're gonna to walk through each of these pieces of the pie. Um, the last thing I'll point out is, is the center. You'll see all the little graphics in the center of the pinwheel, um, which in essence says that this applies to any and all sectors. So whether it's health, agriculture, education, economic development, risk management is a tool um, that is used broadly. Next slide, please. So the first slice of the pie talks about analyzing risk. Um, and so this is really understanding what it is that you are attempting to lessen your exposure to. Which risks? Who is affected by these risks? What is their level of vulnerability? And what are their resilience capacities? All of those factors influence people's ability to withstand shock. And as Catherine mentioned in her opening remarks, each of these slides contains an example. Um, I'm not gonna read through each one, but we wanted to provide them as sort of a grounding of what this looks like in real time. Um, and just to say, you know, analyze risk, there's so many tools for different purposes, right? You've got food security analysis, you have climate resilient analysis, you have political economy analysis. These are all tools that we use as an agency to help us identify and analyze what risk we're exposed to. So again, the example here talks about um, an example of flood monitoring and early warning and being able to provide real-time examples to NGOs and civil society answers to be able to stay ahead of devastating floods in Nepal and Bangladesh. Next slide, please. So the next piece of the pie is avert. How do we avert risk? How do we avert the risk that we have just identified, right? And whether again, this is an environmental risk, a health risk, an economic risk, potential for conflict, um, what can we do that will lessen the impact of that? So on the left-hand side, we have a couple examples for environment, for example, you know, natural resource management investments, um, climate smart agriculture, improving the access to data, as I just stated in the example of Nepal and Bangladesh, strengthening early warning systems. You know, how are we strengthening these systems to help mitigate our risk to exposures? And the example here is Cyclone Ida, which we'll talk about again later. Um, but it in essence says, when we do, the planning, preparedness, pre-financing, we're able to mitigate loss of life, loss of income, loss, loss of livestock, et cetera. So this is about how we can avert. Next slide, please. And the third piece of the pie talks about how do we adapt? Um, and so if you think about resilience capacities, we know there's absorbative, adaptive, and transformative. Adaptive is the piece that says, what can I do to make a change that might help me to better mitigate my exposure to risk? Um, so this talks about really building resilience capacities, building savings and assets, um, having skill development, training, mentorships, uh, having access to information, whether that's agricultural data, rainfall data, um, health system shocks, um, you know, information that allows you to prepare and plan in advance and also builds your um, self-confidence and your self-advocacy of, of feeling better informed to take choices on your own behalf. Um, and the example that we give here is uh, the Productive Safety Net Program in Ethiopia, where um, layering livelihood diversification activities, drought insurance, health insurance, onto the existing social protection system in Ethiopia allowed people to adapt to risk. So it strengthened their 
um, resilience and helped them to overcome future shock. Next slide, please. So this fourth piece of the pie, we like to use the term share what you can't bear. Um, and you know, that's what risk transfer means. I can't manage this alone. What external help can I help can I seek that will help me get through this? And so here we're talking about purchasing insurance. You know, domestically that would look like health insurance, car insurance, homeowners insurance. Um, internationally, you're talking more about um, crop insurance, livestock insurance. You know, what are what are your sources of livelihood that need to be protected? protected that you cannot protect through your own adaptations. Catherine's gonna walk us through this more in depth in our disaster risk financing portion of this, but we just wanted to introduce this sort of idea of analyze it, avert it, adapt to it, and when you can't do anything else, transfer it. Um, and again, the example here is of an insurance policy that was purchased um, through the World Food Program, complementing a sovereign insurance policy that did trigger because of a catastrophic drought and paid out. Next slide, please. So here you have disaster strikes. And in this case, in Madagascar, each of the steps that I just identified for you were taken. And so priority risks were, were pre-identified. A disaster risk management strategy was developed um, and risks were able to be, exposure to risk was able to be reduced um, and communities were able to build cyclone resistant villages. So that's just as an example of how using each of those tools can lead to a better outcome when disaster strikes. And I will hand over to Catherine to take you through the left side of our graphic. Thank you, Laura. I'm always reminded in moments like this how lucky I am to work with you. So here we go. Um, okay, so as Laura pointed out, once the disaster strikes, the shock or stressor is experienced, we're in response mode. And that happens pretty much immediately. And if we're lucky, it happens in an anticipatory fashion. Um, in the case of a cyclone or even a drought, we can we can anticipate these risks. And so um, sort of the, the right hand of the uh, pinwheel, as Laura just described, is our opportunity to pre-plan, pre-finance, uh, pre-position. And so in the response, one of the core uh, elements that can be so helpful is that foundational layer of social protection. Because in the, in the response period, if there are existing systems, those social protection benefits can be paid out quickly. Um, that system is there. But we, of course, we also have that humanitarian assistance. We have an insurance payout if we're lucky. Um, there's emergency loans that can be issued. The country can have a contingent credit payout and of course a budget reallocation. So all of these elements are so important in that res immediate response period. Next slide, please. So the recovery is one of the most key elements of building resilient outcomes. This is our opportunity and sort of the medium term to rebuild critical infrastructure and transportation systems, for example, with an eye to how these systems could survive the next shock. That could be a cyclone um, that we don't know when it's coming, but we know it's gonna come again and we don't know the severity, but we wanna be prepared for the worst case scenario. So how do you rebuild in a resilient way? Of course, we also need to restore basic services, return to doctor's appointments, go back to school, return to to regular life, which can be hard in the wake of a catastrophic event, but that's key in the recovery period. We need to revive livelihoods, but also have an, an eye towards diversifying livelihoods. We are in a world that is changing due to climate change. How do we prepare for that? How do we have you know, green jobs? How do we um, have diversified livelihoods in a, in a world where there are increasing droughts and severity and frequency? It is key at the household level to replenish savings and assets. 
Often with a disaster, people are unfortunately negative coping through th selling off assets. They're using any money they might have in the bank. And so this is an important period to get back to normal. And what we ideally would have in our recovery period is a building or restrengthening of our risk-informed, shock-responsive, and adaptive social protection system. Next slide, please. So many of you participating in this meeting today are familiar, familiar with our resilience framework. This conceptual framework, it has been developed um, as a way for us in the Center for Resilience and beyond to understand how to build resilience. And so I just wanted to connect our pinwheel to this conceptual framework image that you are most likely already familiar with. So on the left, when you have context, you have um, your specific risk situation. That would be your risk identification um, in a holistic way, preparing for the shock or disturbance as they put here. And then a strong focus on the adaptive, absorptive, and transformative capacities. The transformative capacities are so essential. And at a large scale systems level, there are opportunities here through disaster risk financing, building social protection systems at the national level, the regional level. We're working on regional risk pooling, Africa, Caribbean, and other um, geographies. And this is an opportunity to work at multiple levels. So we, we are more familiar perhaps with the community level, the household level, but now we're really looking at this national level, this system strengthening. There's great opportunities here for USAID and uh, partner countries and development uh, partners globally. So again, as you look to the right side of the conceptual framework, we of course want to be better off than before. We want that opportunity in our response and recovery and our anticipatory action to prepare households, communities, countries, to be better off than before because we live in a world of increasing risk. And the hope is that those well being outcomes will be achieved for the people that we serve. We want them to have food security. We want them to have adequate money in the bank for their you know, various needs. We want them to be in strong psychological and physical health. And so all of this is essential to understanding how disaster risk management approach. Um, links with resilient outcomes. Next slide, please. So here we'll offer three key takeaways from this portion of the presentation, the disaster risk management overview. Please keep your eyes focused on the pin wheel to the right. This we feel captures um, the approach that, that we're discussing. It's an opportunity for understanding risk probability and exposure and provides a set of tools for managing risk, some of which we spoke about today. Early, predictable, and well-coordinated responses can lessen negative coping, shorten recovery periods, and ensure resilient outcomes. USAID supports countries in mainstreaming disaster and climate risk management into national and local development planning and identifying and pre-financing appropriate disaster risk financing mechanisms. At this point, I'll turn it over to Lara for the social protection portion of our presentation. Next slide, please. Great, Catherine, thank you so much. So um, again, the, the DRM captures each of these pieces. We are pulling out um, social protection and we're pulling out disaster risk financing because those tend to be more elusive parts of disaster risk management. And so here, as, as we started the presentation with the definition of disaster risk management, USAID's definition of social protection is as a set of policies and programs that are aimed at preventing, reducing, and eliminating economic and social vulnerabilities to poverty and deprivation from birth to old age. And that's a key statement because this is a life cycle approach. 
Next slide, please. So here we have another graphic. Um, this was adapted from, from the World Bank. And I actually, I really love this graphic because it shows the depth and breadth of what a fully functional social protection system can do. Um, people typically, when they hear the word social protection, they think social assistance, right? They think cash transfers, they think um, food, they think handout. Um, and social assistance, while it tends to be the largest component of social protection programs, meets acute temporary needs um, for populations in distress. The whole picture is much bigger of what social protection can do. So on the left side of the graphic, you will see the goals, objectives, and outcomes of social protection. So you see this idea of reducing poverty and inequality, protecting people across their life cycle and ensuring that they have adequate living standards to be able to face the shocks and stresses that will come to us across our life cycle. And thirdly, this idea of improving economic opportunities through inclusive growth, through formal and informal employment and diversified livelihoods. So it really is the full picture. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see sort of the components of tools of what that looks like. And again, I think most people are most familiar with social assistance. So this idea of cash or transfers in an emergency situation. Um, we also wanted to tie in, how does this relate to climate? And so thinking about climate sensitive public works, um, watershed management, communal land restoration, these are all things that can also be done um, through cash or food for work. And then the second pillar is, is social insurance. So social insur insurance and labor market programs are, are contributory sources of social protection. So what does that mean? It means you're buying into it. So social assistance you are receiving without any contribution in a moment of distress in an acute period. Social insurance and labor market are more structured protection over time. So example for social insurance is, you know, employee, employee benefits, sick leave, severance leave, workers comp, um, health insurance that you buy into through your company, crop and livestock insurance. These are all um, social insurance components. And then you have labor market programs. And um, I think here, again, people tend to think of like trade policy and things that are sort of out of our fear that we don't relate to. But it also means um, employment incentives. It means skill building, capacity development. It means, you know, right sizing people's skills to move into the future. And right now, um, when we talk about just transition and we talk about green economy, you know, people need different jobs in order to be safe in the future. And so this component of social protection addresses that. And, you know, again, why is it here today? Social protection's risk management function um, is, an, is a critical tool for building resilience. Social protection, when fully functional, helps people meet their essential needs and it helps people manage risks that can prevent or lessen negative impacts during periods of stress. Next slide, please. So I put this in here because I really sort of wanted to house social protection in the global, global agenda and continue the um, widening of our understanding of it and how um, many aspects across different sectors that social protection can can touch. And so, you know, certain needs must be met in order for people to have a decent life. We need food, we need shelter, we need access to basic services such as education, healthcare, and we need we need a way to have decent work and economic growth. Um, and so social protection as you see around the SGD circle here, has the possibility to address these needs in multiple sectors of the SGD goals. So it really is um, a vital tool 
in achieving a zero hunger world, as well as moving the needle on our 2030 sustainable development agenda. And um, just to say, and I know people know this, but you know, conflict, COVID, climate have really dramatically pushed back efforts to meeting these 2030 agenda goals. And so catalytic investments in social protection are essential in order to get us back on track in achieving these objectives that were set out. Next slide, please. So again, this is sort of capturing what a core social protection system looks like. And I, and I just wanna clarify for today's purpose, um, I am speaking mostly of formal public sector, national government social protection systems. There are also, as Catherine mentioned, informal systems that work at household, community, regional. Um, but for the, for, for the focus of this presentation, I'm talking about public sector formal social protection. And so, you know, I won't go through this slide, but it takes us back to the definition of, you know, a set of policies and programs that protect people across their life cycle as well as equip them for better opportunities in the future. And so this just shows um, across a life cycle from families to pregnancy to childhood, the different types of interventions um, that can be provided for people. That's what a comprehensive social protection system looks like. Next slide, please. I feel like we're missing a couple slides here. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about shock responsive social protection and um, adaptive social protection. Those are two words that are used interchangeably, but sort of wanted to say, um, I don't know, Sophie, we're missing like my Rubik's cube and um, my graduation slide. Is there a slide mix up? Can those be found? Is that possible? Okay. <laughs> um, and so again, building on sort of the core systems that I was just showing to you, um, what does that look like? What does that look like from a policy framework? What does that look like from a program design and implementation and delivery? And you know, the key point that I wanna make about core social protection systems is really they have the potential to break intergenerational cycles of poverty. And they have that potential by enhancing human and social capital. Sounds like jargon, right? What does it mean? Skill development, job training, building investments in productive assets, increasing household income, increasing savings, increasing access to healthcare, increasing access to education. These are the core essential needs that human beings have. And these systems, um, when designed well, can do that. And, and this, this pie sort of shows the multiple layers that are necessary, but it's similar to the DRM framework, right? You're assessing what is happening, you're enrolling the right people, you're figuring out the benefits, and then you're managing their ability to get them. So that is um, the core social protection system. Slide, please. Yay, back on track. <laughs> so this is shock responsive social protection. You know, these are really, again, these are buzzwords right now, but what do these buzzwords mean and why are they important? Um, COVID in particular showed us the tremendous potential for social protection to serve as a core response mechanism to a large scale shock. And as Catherine said, you know, the system is established, the um, logistics of the system are established. You've got pipelines for money to flow. You have ways to identify people. And so making it shock responsive means that it is risk informed. So it can predict in advance what it could expect, negotiate those memorandums of understanding with, for example, the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Agriculture. You know, lay the foundation so that this 
system can be an accordion that expands in order to address people that are not traditionally part of this system. So, so what do we have? There's these four kind of buzzwords, adequacy, coverage, quality, comprehensiveness. So in the middle is our core system that I just described to you. Um, adequacy is the level of protection. So are they, are people receiving the correct amount of benefits in order to help them sustain this um, essential needs? Coverage. So if for COVID, for example, you know, the largest hit population was informal workers. Informal workers are not traditionally part of a social protection system, right? They are, they have a source of income. Um, it's not stable, but they have a source of income. They're not in the lower ranking, um, lower poverty quartile, say. Um, so expanding who is able to be covered during times of crises. And we saw this happen beautifully across the world. Um, and then benefits and services, like do we have the right mixture of benefits? So again, I'll use the case of informal workers. And there is there are not protected protection measures for informal workers. And that is something that needs to be taken into account in order for the system to serve as a central response mechanism during a large scale shock. System strength, again, goes back to the core program. Is it working well? Is it well established? Does it have the memorandums of understanding that it needs, et cetera? Next slide, please. Fabulous. And so this takes us back to, again, adaptive. And as I was saying initially, you know, shock responsive and adaptive um, are used interchangeably, but they're really, they're different. Um, adaptive is, thinking of resilience capacities, what changes can I make in order to better overcome a shock and, and move forwards from the resilience livelihood framework that Catherine showed, you know, the pathway to doing better, bouncing back, you know, we want people to do better. And so um, adaptive social protection is really this, this mix of um, other programs that are layered and sequenced onto a traditional social protection program in order to address the multidimensional needs of the poorest. And this is adapted from the BRAC model. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, but you'll see, you know, it starts with livelihood promotion. So people are getting skill building and asset transfers, and it's time bound. So across the bottom, you see zero to 24 months. This is a 24 month intervention. Um, I think it is taking place in 120 countries around the world. It has been for the last 20 years and um, proven successful at really reducing poverty and creating pathways out of poverty. And so again, it's layered. You've got your social protection core support. You have training layered on top of that, savings layered on top of that. And then Catherine mentioned um, psychosocial support and mental well-being. So you have that sort of component of life skills, of um, empowerment, of agency that builds self-confidence for people to be able to then use the skills that they are um, developing. And so that is what adaptive social protection looks like. Next slide, please. So here would be where our key takeaways are. <laughs> our slides are out of order. Um, but you know, the, the main thing that I wanna say is, is really um, the dual nature of social protection as it relates to risk management and its ability to sustain vulnerable populations through times of crises, as well as help people achieve, achieve human dignity. This is really why we're talking about this. It provides for faster and more efficient responses when the systems are set up and it reaches more people. Um, there are studies both in the state of economic inclusion from 2020 and um, I had to read more recently. I think it was the World Food Program Social Protection Policy that talks about the order of magnitude of a national social protection system so far exceeds any humanitarian response. So these are systems that we need to invest in 
for catalytic and transformative change. And I'll turn over to Catherine to talk about disaster risk financing. Wonderful, thank you, Laura. You rolled with the unanticipated risk of <laughs> the slides being out of order, which was just a, a tech issue when we went from one version to another. So thank you for that, Laura. I always learn so much from you about social protection and the way you frame it. And as we discussed before, social protection is really the foundation, foundational level. And as we saw in the pinwheel, the transfer of risk through financial tools is the disaster risk financing portion. So it's never going to be the full picture for disaster risk management, but it's a perhaps new to many of us um, opportunity um, and option. Uh, so here our definition is disaster risk financing is ex ante financial tools to manage risk. So we're about, about to discuss many of those tools in our toolbox. Next slide, please. Great, so the KDLT team helped us develop this infographic, which we were really excited about because, you know, this is a new concept for many of us at USAID and with our partners. And so here you see on the pinwheel, we've got transfer risk at the end, and this is really aimed in many cases at the catastrophic risk, the cyclone that wipes out villages, the catastrophic drought where the seeds never germinated, right? This is the kind of severity that sovereign risk insurance um, can tackle. And so at the bottom of the graph, you see an example of a sovereign risk insurance um, uh, situation. And so we have our anticipatory action. And actually I'll talk about it in terms of the African Regional Risk Pool ARC, the Africa Risk Capacity and the public-private partnership they have with ARC Limited, which is a regional risk pool private insurance company from which you can purchase drought and cyclone policies at the national level, either through the sovereign government and or our replica, which is the WFP humanitarian complement to the art group. So for example, in Mali last year, they identified the risk of severe catastrophic drought. In May of 2021, they purchased both the sovereign, the government of Mali, and WFP, the ARC replica piece, uh, risk insurance for drought. Indeed, we discovered last summer that it was a catastrophic drought and the seeds did not germinate. We anticipated that this would happen and the partners and the government started to discuss um, what, how, what we would do in the second half in the response. So let me go through the first part. The anticipatory action, you identify the risk, you set the indicators for drought, it's rainfall, vegetation, greenness, the draft response plan. What would we want to give uh, farmers who have had a crop failure? Food, cash, community asset building, sometimes it's uh, seeds or tools. And then you purchase the policy. Disaster strikes, the insurance triggers, it's determined, it's paid out in the ARC Limited case within 10 days, it's through contract. And then the final response plan is approved and the, the activities are implemented. The disaster risk, um, the disaster re relief is distributed. So this infographic just gives us the opportunity to share this um, with our partners and with USCID. Next slide, please. So here we just want to underline what the outcome is that we're looking for. We want to help partner governments build systems where they can pre-plan, pre-arrange financing for known disasters, such as cyclones, drought, uh, floods, it could be a number of things. And so we don't know when the disaster will happen, but we know it'll happen. Um, we don't know the frequency or the severity, but we need to prepare ahead. We've got a few points here that are, um, from the, from the research, we, this is a proven concept. This type of prearranged financing can save lives, livelihoods, um, and it also saves money. If we can invest in these resilient systems in advance of shocks and stressors, the people will, will, ha will not have to negative cope as much and we will be more successful at our jobs. Next slide, please.
So these graphs come from our wonderful partners at the World Bank who do their own webinars on disaster risk financing, which we can recommend. And we help support through our financial resilience program at the World Bank. And the idea here with these graphs is to show that we are intending to do a risk layering approach. There is no single instrument that can address all risks. So the idea with risk layering is you can find the appropriate tool for the severity and the frequency of that hazard risk disaster. So on the left, you see um, how layer one is sort of the high frequency, few losses, you're doing your risk mitigation. And so you might look at that as your social protection system. Hopefully you have that, that foundational layer. Layer two is your shock responsive. So this can be shock responsive or adaptive based on the situation to help the populations we serve shoulder a disaster. And now layer three is where we're talking about, for example, um, insurance, the risk transfer portion. This could be the catastrophic drought in Mali that we discussed and that payout that was triggered. Um, it could be a cap bond that a country has purchased from the World Bank. So this is just, we need to look at the situation holistically. It's a complicated world and it deserves a com comprehensive disaster risk management strategy um, for which disaster risk financing um, is, is an important piece of the puzzle. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. So again, this matrix is an opportunity to look at examples of risk management tools. It separates out degree of risk and also um, micro, uh, meso and macro levels. So sometimes with our activities, we might understand more of the household, the community, um, all the wonderful programs we have about crop diversification. Um, we, we study migration, how is this used in, in, in positive ways as well as um, you know, something that we might want to address more. Um, we're looking at you know, savings in livestock, um, having food stores to prepare. And then we're also looking at the market systems. Um, here we might look at the regional risk pooling opportunities, um, insurance, uh, formal savings, and then we have the government level where governments are invest investing in or early warning systems that's so essential. They've got their contingent credit and their um, regional risk pooling opportunities, for example, the ARC program that we discussed. So um, again, this matrix we hope is, an, is, is a tool, is a resource um, that you can use in, in thinking through disastrous financing. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. Um, we've had the opportunity over the last 10 years or so in the Center for Resilience, um, in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID, to invest in disaster risk management. So we have a number of investments that I've outlined at the bottom. We have ARC Replica, which I spoke about. We have Adrifi, which is also part of the um, ARC group, which is um, the African Disaster Risk Financing Program, which is um, implemented by the African Development Program in coordination with the other partners. We have the Financial Resilience Program with our wonderful colleagues at the World Bank, which is a follow-on from our Agriculture Insurance Development Program. We have the QUIC Program, which helps private insurers in Africa, East Africa, and, and now the Sahel to certify the quality of their crop insurance products. Because as we know, if a farmer purchases an insurance policy and it doesn't work correctly, they might not trust the system again for seven to nine years. We also invest in the Feed the Future Innovation Lab at UC Davis that works with um, over, over 20 partners to do research projects in 12 countries. Additionally, we have a program looking at insurance as an add-on um, to the BOMA project, which works with female um, entrepreneurs um, to work on their financial resilience. Additionally, last year in the margins of the G7, we joined three partnerships. The Insurance Resilience Global Partnership, or IGP, aims to protect 500 million um, of the most vulnerable people against climate and disaster risk um, by 2025. REAP, or the Risk Informed Early Action Partnership, aims to protect a billion people with early action, um, disaster coverage, and other interventions. The Insurance Development Forum brings together 
private insurance, um, civil society actors, partner governments, donors, and other actor, academics and other actors to come um, together on solutions that will work national level, community level, regional level. I should let Laura talk about this part, but briefly I'll just say that we're looking towards, um, we're in the process of joining USP 2030 and SPIACB, which are the two key international partnerships globally for uh, social protection. Next slide, please. All right, so I will turn this over to Lara for the first three takeaways. Next slide, please. Fantastic. So we are right one minute past time, but we'll leave you with our key takeaways and open up for um, robust dialogue and Q&A with all of our participants. Um, so in essence, just to recap, disaster risk management plans or strategies really allow for communities, countries, individuals to identify their risk exposure and to plan and prepare for how to manage that risk. And again, share what they can't bear. Um, robust social protection systems that are agile, shock responsive and adaptive, put a quiz in there to tell, ask for you to tell me what the difference is between shock responsive and adaptive. Um, can prevent loss of lives, can avert social and economic losses in future crises, as well as, again, build human dignity and meet people's essential needs so that they have the opportunity to have a decent life. Um, and our third bullet is, you know, this idea of the early, predictable, well-coordinated responses to shocks and stresses can mitigate negative coping mechanisms, such as reduced food consumption, livestock death, distressed productive asset sales, um, and you know, really pre-arranged is pre-agreed to. So you have accountability with the partners um, and the actors that are doing this. You have predefined what will happen when disaster strikes, and you already have the money to efficiently and effectively respond. I'll turn it over to Catherine for our final three takeaways. Great, thank you, Laura. So as I spoke about in the disaster risk financing section, we know that prearranged finance increases the speed, predictability, and effectiveness of disaster response and recovery. It's a new field to many, but those who are working on it are seeing it work, and so it's just, part of our job to help explain it. And um, we're excited as USAID in, invests more and more in this space. So a lot of this that we have discussed today in terms of a disaster risk management approach is about strengthening systems. This is about locally led, locally owned, country led, country owned systems that allow for a better resilient world. And we have never needed this more. It, with the increased frequency and intensity of climatic events, it is urgent that we build and we help build and help strengthen these systems for partner governments and countries. So at that, I think we will uh, hand it over to Samantha, who's going to help moderate our fruitful discussion today. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Looking forward to this conversation. We have some terrific questions that have come in from the Q&A. Um, please feel free to continue to put questions in there, and we'll get to as many as we can um, over the course of the next 25 minutes. All right, so our first question is actually one for both you uh, and Laura to answer, Catherine. And the question is, what are USAID's biggest analytical gaps that, if improved, would enable more responsive programming? We'd love to hear a bit from each of you. Kasson, if you'd like to begin. Wonderful, thank you for the question. Absolutely, we can see at a country level that there are gaps in the understanding of sort of, di there's a need for more diagnostic analytics to understand on a country basis, which is often how um, we 
we donate for for USAID, um, what is needed, what is there, what the partner government wants, and our investments with the Financial Resilience Program at the World Bank is one way that that sort of technical assistance and capacity building is given. Um, but Laura and I and others um, at the agency have identified that more diagnostic at the sort of country level would be very useful. Um, over to you, Laura. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, really grounding sort of assessment, feasibility, diagnostic tools at the country level. I think that there is a plethora of global evidence and um, what we need to know specifically is, you know, how is this social, for example, social protection system set up? Does it have its core functionality? Do we need to work on targeting? Do we need to work on payment mechanisms? Um, you know, how, how does it work and how can it expand? So how can we get it to one, provide a basic level of coverage universally within the country, then be able to respond to shock as well as help transition people off of social protection as necessary. So that's grounded. It's not, uh, you know, it's not a big impact evaluation. It's, it is operational formative diagnostic research of how we can really practically invest in something that will be transformative now. Over. Thank you, Laura. We'll actually stay with you for our next question. This comes in from Michelle gonzalez Mendia, who asks, how is USAID providing support and funding to assess and build social protection systems for resilience? So um, my answer to that is predominantly informally at this time. So, you know, I, I said in the beginning, I was focusing on our desire to support large scale public um, formal systems. USAID's investments to date um, focus on informal, which is community safety nets, which is um, rotating grain storage banks, um, you know, so linked to um, food security, uh, natural resource management, preventing, you know, dams, building gabions, protecting communal assets that will reduce communal risk. And those are all forms of social, social protection, as well as this job training. And, you know, we do a lot of um, literacy and numeracy. We do a lot of financial education. I mean, these are all pieces of the puzzle that help to build um, human capacity, human aspirations. Um, but we're not, not never. We're not mostly investing in these large scale systems, which is where I would like us to go. Thanks, Laura. Um, all the work you're doing, I'm sure, is moving us in that direction. Um, the next question is for Catherine. Catherine, this comes from Dan Ryan, who asks What role does the DFC have in disaster risk financing? And perhaps also spell out uh, DFC for the group as well. Thank you. Wonderful, Dan, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, the Development Finance Corporation is another partner that we have here in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Um, and I wish uh, I could send this over to my colleague, Songbei, who's, you know, works on this every day. Um, but I'll just say that the Development Finance Corporation is very interested um, in disastrous financing, and they've created, you know, perhaps more and more a partnership with the Insurance Development Forum. And, um, they are interested in what we're doing. They tend to be more along the infrastructure lines. What we're talking about with the ARC um, group is, you know, this prearranged disaster financing for um, for immediate response, you know, immediate humanitarian response. So it's a little bit different. And so part of our um, role here is to help describe that, but, you know, we've been in communication and I know they've been working closely with the Insurance Development Forum um, to better understand linkages. Thank you. You're on mute, Samantha. Thank you very much. Next question is for Laura from Amanda Quintana, who asks, these models of shock response and social protection are great in theory. How does USAID apply these principles in their programs? 
Can you cover specific indicators, metrics, or activities? So I would say the tools that USAID has in its wheelhouse right now are most commonly referred to as crisis modifiers. And so um, there is an established, used to, this is old food for peace days, but you used to be able to have a 10% um, allocation of your budget that could be moved immediately to emergency need. And I think, you know, I think the agency is striving more and more um, to have more mechanisms that allow for shock responsiveness, that allow for programs to pivot, that allow for um, using resources on the table in as you are getting new resources, the indicators and the specifics would just would really depend on the country country situation and the program that you are attempting um, to identify. But I'll just give one example. So, for example, you have um, I use the Productive Safety Net Program in Ethiopia. You know, you have a set transfer allocation during the lean season. You have a set ration size that reaches a designated amount of people. Crisis strikes and you need to extend those benefits. So those benefits could be one extended beyond the lean season to cover people's needs. The amount of the benefit could be increased based on inflation, market prices, et cetera. So you're, you're making adaptations to ensure that that um, sustainable level of well-being can be maintained. Be adding in new people, right? That we talked about coverage that don't have access to those benefits. So that's just one example in the in the productive safety net program of what happens, right? Benefit goes up, extends longer, brings in new people. And you know, Ethiopia is very unique in that the productive safety net program is a development first response. When that development first response is overwhelmed, there is this um, humanitarian response that's blanketed around it. So it automatically, again, shock responsive, serves as a system to t handle the overflow that the development response cannot. But it is pre-planned and pre-identified. So we know if this happens, then this kicks in. I hope that helps. Thanks, Laura. And I would ask anyone who has further questions, um, put them in the Q&A. And if, uh, if we need be, we can get to them and do any more clarification. Thank you so much for that um, start though, Laura. The next question is for Catherine. This is from Michael Coons. How did the Mali stakeholders come to the decision to purchase the insurance policies? Thank you. You know, one of the great things about Mali is through their various governments over the last, you know, five, 10 years, there has been a consistent technical advisor or team who understands disasters financing really well. So I say that as background because our partners, you know, the Africa Risk Capacity, which is a specialized agency of the African Union, African Development Bank, World Food Program that has been very involved um, in communicating um, with the government of Mali, there is that strong technical background that has lasted. Same thing with Burkina Faso. So, um, so through that, um, they were approached and offered this opportunity and the supporting donor was FCDO um, from the UK. And so I think, actually, I would say a lot of African Union countries understand this whole concept even more so than than many of us um, in other parts of the world. So, um, you know, quite literally, they were approached. Uh, there was a comprehensive risk management strategy that was developed, contingency plans, um, you know, draft response plan, and then things lined up in time to purchase the policy in time. And then it paid out both at the humanitarian level, the 7 million and 14 million at the um, at the sovereign level. Thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine, for that. Can I, I just, can I just add on to that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, you know, I would say one of the primary reasons that we are interested in investing in African risk capacity and African risk capacity replica is the pre-work that takes place, right? So it is this whole 
um, series of workshops, country engagements that really um, are focused on developing this comprehensive disaster risk management strategy. So again, talking about all the things we just talked about, what, what are the risks that we're trying to protect ourselves from? What are the various instruments across the risk layers that are necessary? And um, getting that plan solidified. Then ARC agency, ARC replica, um, certifies that the government like knows what they're getting themselves into. They're qualified to make a decision as to whether or not they want an insurance policy. Then they develop, you know, they develop exactly what the triggers will be, which determines the cost. I mean, it's probably too into the weeds, but the point is there's this technical process that gets to a certification of good standing that makes countries eligible to purchase these policies. And the way replica works is it complements, right? So the government of Mali, let's say, for example, only has sufficient resources to cover 10% of the population in need. And so Replica, which is a humanitarian arm, then comes in and says, we'll purchase another 10%. We'll cover another 10% of your population. So then you have 20% of the population um, that's covered. And the plan is developed in unison. So while the funding sources are different, it is one response plan. Um, and it's that planning that we're really most interested in. Thank you very much, both Laura and Catherine, for your responses to that question. The next question is for you, Laura. And the question is, how can social protection systems be more inclusive and cater better to those who do not have the required documents that are usually needed from them what is USAID's experience on this? It's a great point, um, and it's a great struggle. Um, I would say some countries are doing better than others. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll just use the most recent Ukraine example, because I have to say I'm, I'm baffled by it and in awe of it, which is to say, um, you know, Poland, opened up four of its largest social protection programs, child benefits, um, I'm not gonna remember what they all are, but they're four largest social protection programs immediately to Ukrainian citizens that had crossed into Poland. And so they set up targeting mechanisms, application mechanisms, et cetera. And you know, these are people without citizenship in that country. Um, there are other countries that are doing it too, but I would say it is um, a frontier that needs further ex uh, um, exploration. And one, and and it is a you know a key topic of the day. Like, how do migrants get covered? How do refugees get covered? Are benefits portable so that IDPs within a country can take them with them? Um, but I think we just have to take hope from the places where it's happening and try and build it into the places where it's not. A lot of that, frankly, is our funding limitations. So again, these sort of catalytic investments in systems, as well as helping um, through the World Bank and other you know, multilateral banks, um, addressing domestic resource mobilization, like these, these pro programs need to be paid for. Um, so. I'll, I'll stop there and just say it's an ongoing challenge that's on the cusp of changing. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, we've got about five minutes left and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Um, and we'll also uh, endeavor to answer any questions after this event that we don't get to now during the Q&A. Um, so next question is actually for both of you. Catherine, I'll ask you to get, get us started. This is from Jennifer Cisse. Um, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, um, who asks, climate was mentioned a bit in passing. I'm curious how RFS sees integrating CCA and climate finance into comprehensive DRM and DRF moving forward. So Catherine, if you wanna get us started, that would be great. Uh, Jennifer Cisse, so nice to hear your name. Um, I would love for us to have a one-on-one. -on -one. For others who don't know, she used to be um, in a similar role to Lara and I before she moved overseas. So wonderful to have your question. Yeah, it's it's actually great that you bring this up. I 
sort of had jotted down a few notes um, for, so for our closing remarks. So I'll, I'll actually share some of those here. Um, we, we can also frame this very much in the world of climate in terms of these international engagements, such as um, COP. We announced at COP26 last year, um, the 21.8 million that we've invested in climate and disaster risk financing with our colleagues over at state, the special envoy for climate's office, John Kerry's office, um, and his great staff. We have these collaborations where we're doing this climate risk um, investing together. And I think there's more interest sort of across the government. We have treasury colleagues who've helped invest in regional risk pooling for mostly you know, cyclones um, in the Pacific, as well as the hurricanes and other risks in the Caribbean and Central America. So um, part of PREPARE, the, um, you know, the, the Biden-Harris administration's um, climate plan, we have a piece of that in pillar three in these investments. We also obviously very much um, are, are, you know, invest in and believe in pillar one, which is about information and pillar two, which is about adaptation. And we are in this sort of um, climate finance, disastrous financing uh, portion, but really there's a disastrous management um, component to all of this. So disastrous management can be applied to many sectors, but right now we really feel like the urgency is around climate um, and helping communities and countries shoulder these risks. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Laura, would you like to provide any response as well? Brilliant. <laughs> okay, anything you'd like to add, Laura? Okay, great. Um, the next question is also for both of you. So maybe we'll start with you, Laura. This comes in from Michelle gonzalez Mendia, who asks, are there any examples we can look at to learn how social protection systems, DRF systems, and DRM systems more broadly build the resilience capacities of the most vulnerable? Um, WFP should pay me for advertising, but uh, <laughs> there is, you know, um, the World Food Program recently put out um, a shock responsive guide for the Caribbean. And I, I think it is one, the, the Caribbean region is one of the best examples of where truly um, disaster risk management, which was already very strong, you know, these are small island states subject to hurricanes all the time. Disaster risk management was robust. And I would say six years ago, they started really looking at what is the role of social protection and how do we really connect this? How do we get social workers on the ground as part of a disaster risk management response? Um, and, you know, it has, connects the variety of actors working across financing, management, social protection. It's really very robust. And I'm just recently, there was an article, uh, an award that came out for Jamaica having purchased this cat bond, which was sort of a new thing in that area. So that tackles DRM, DRF, social protection, and it's a very well done publication. So I would I would guide you to that for some real time examples. Thank you, Laura. Catherine, this will be our final response to a question before we go to closing remarks. Would you like to add anything? Okay. Well uh, to not shortchange any questions, I think I'll ask you, Laura, perhaps to um, provide your closing remarks and then over to Catherine for the remainder of our program. Thank you very much. Uh, I will say Catherine has our closing remarks, but um, just to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And um, we really hope that we've been able to sort of connect the dots of how these words and sectors interact with one another and how they really are um, a comprehensive way to address the multiple shocks that people are facing. And, um, you know, we know, as Catherine said, the intensity of climatic events are increasing. Um, health, pandemic, uh, 
pest epidemic. You know, the world is really increasingly, increasingly complex and our responses are increasingly protracted. And so really um, utilizing these tools to the best of our ability, strengthen public sector, large scale systems um, to respond is where we want to go. And, you know, disaster risk management is, is the house um, that these different tools fit into but the outcome is strengthening resilience for individuals, for households, for communities, for governments, um, helping people to weather the storm and come through it better. Um, I did not have any of those remarks planned. I just gave them off the cuff. So I hope it didn't mess you up, Catherine, <laughs> over to you. No, that was fantastic. I mean, as as many of you may know us and, and know of our work, part of our job in the Center for Resilience is to make connections, be constantly learning, um, constantly considering both the pros and cons of, of some of these investments and opportunities and keeping that dialogue very much open within USAID, within the whole of government, um, with other donor partners, with uh, multilaterals such as the African Union, the African Development Bank, um, all of our wonderful implementing partners. And so I, we believe this is an iterative process. KDLT has done a wonderful job with us spending hours and hours to develop this slide deck, which is gonna be shared with all of you in addition to this recording. But we urge you to reach out to us. You, we urge you to learn more about these partnerships and approaches and how it connects to your work, wherever that region is in the world. We can learn from you, you can learn from us. So thank you so much for spending this hour and 15 with us on your Tuesday morning. We're very grateful for your time.